Arterburn is an internationally known public speaker that has been featured on various national media platforms. He is the founder and chairman of New Life Ministries and host of the number one nationally syndicated Christian counseling talk show, New Life Live. He has authored and co-authored over 100 books, including bestsellers Every Man's Battle, Toxic Faith, and Healing is a Choice. Steve's ministry endeavors focus on identifying and responding to the needs of those seeking healing and restoration through God's truth. Please welcome Steve Arterburn. Thank you. Thank you. You know, God has allowed me to do some uh, really fun, amazing things, and uh, I've been so fortunate. But I gotta tell you, there is uh, no greater privilege than to get to be the teaching pastor of this great church. Many of you may not know, this is the third fastest growing church in America, according to the folks that keep track of that. And I've been part of a lot of churches, and uh, I've got to tell you, the integrity, the credibility, and, you know, things just keep getting better. Uh, I just experienced the, the best worship experience I've ever had here at Northview just then, and I thank that worship team. But we, um, we love this church. Um, I love you. I love getting to speak with you. I hope I can make some kind of a difference. We love the difference that this church is making in the lives of our children, and uh, it's just great to be here this weekend here on, uh, I don't know how you spent your extra day yesterday on leap year day. Uh, there were four couples, uh, Derek Irvin told me this, so he keeps track of this, four couples were married in Hell, uh, Michigan, Hell, Michigan. They went there, they were married, and isn't that something? Some of you think I wasn't married in Hell, I'm living in it, that's not good. We can, we can work on that, and, uh, but isn't it great that uh, they only have to uh, remember their anniversary every fourth year. I think that's so cool. We, uh, I have, as, as you know, and I've shared, and I'll share more, attention deficit disorder, so I had to get married on a day I wouldn't forget. So I got married uh, on 345. It was uh, March the 4th, uh, 2005. We are celebrating our 15th anniversary, and it's just... Oh my goodness, for my wife to endure another year with me is truly cause for celebration. And you know, we're a blended family, and uh, that's usually not a very good idea. Uh, most of the kids think it's a hostage takeover kind of situation there, and, but our kids love each other, and we're, uh, we're really grateful to get to be together. We're, we're kind of different, my wife and me, and uh, it is, um, yeah, it is a challenge, I know, to her. But we, uh, we took Friday, last Friday and Saturday, to celebrate, and uh, we went down to our favorite place here, uh, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, called Newfields, and we just love art. She's a great artist. My son, Solomon, he's a great artist. My daughter, she loves art, and uh, my first three letters of my name, art. So we're just an art family. We love it. And... Um, and we, did, we went down there, and you know, she and I, we see things differently. Like there was this picture of the, this, these two old guys, and they're going down a dirt road like back in the 1800s, and it looked like a photograph. And, and I'm just amazed, at, and I said, man, it makes you wonder, you know? And I'm thinking how somebody could paint like that. And, and she says, yeah, the, those, those men there, they, they must be so hungry. And she was in the painting. I was on the painting. She's in the, though, and they didn't have... Uh, protein bars to put in their pocket and, and uh, things like that. And uh, that's just, she's different. You know, I have attention deficit disorder. She has attention, retention, and another thing, dimension uh, disorder. So, but we saw this other painting. This was done by a German painter. Can't really see it that well, but it's uh, Washington Street back in 1894. And I just think it's one of the most fantastic, it's huge, it's like five by eight or something. And she looks at it, and she goes, oh, wow, uh, there's something not right. <laughs> I said, what? Uh, you think they're hungry? And, and uh, no. Uh, she, she said, there, there are no, uh, no horse droppings in the street. Oh, you're right. Yeah, there are. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, you're going to do an eight by five painting. Maybe you wouldn't want to do that in there. Well, before we left the museum, I had discovered that in 1894, 
there was a horse manure crisis, actually, in New York City. 2.5 million pounds a day of stuff that they, and she knew that that was a reality. And in fact, Indianapolis had the first urban planning meeting here in Indy, and the number one topic agenda, horse dropping. Isn't that, and my wife knew all that. It's just all in her head. She's got all those details right there. And so I'd been working on my message, and I thought, you know, <laughs> we all have a bit of a problem with fertilizer in our lives. And our, many of us, if you're like me, you've ended up and you think the Christian life is just taking your wheelbarrow full of junk and shame and struggle and, and just being faithful and getting it to the next place. And you're just religiously doing that. And that is your life. And I've certainly been there more often than I want to be, and I'm here to tell you, and this whole series is here uh, to tell you, that we were all made for more. And I, I just hope I don't mess up uh, Steve Carter's, uh, who uh, taught me to uh, dress in a monochromatic uh, fashion. Uh, I, did, uh, I chose navy blue versus the black with shoes contrasting, which he doesn't do. But anyway... I don't want to mess up his series, and I'm so grateful that uh, I was able to help him out, and, uh, but he'll come back next week and clean up, uh, well, don't want to use that phrase, but he'll take care of anything uh, that's there. But if you are burdened today, I'm just telling you, there's a message that, that Paul wanted Timothy to know. And there are eight different things. I usually like to have three points in a poem, but he's got eight things. And three are things to avoid. Five are really great things to have. But it's not just Paul writing to Timothy. It's God writing to us. It's our message. And there's not one word in there that doesn't apply to us. And I'm just so grateful to be able to share this with you. And so we're going to get started here. And, you know, Timothy is so fortunate to have this mentor, Paul, who wants him to know everything possible that he can give him before Paul knows he's going to die in Rome. They're going to put him to death, and he just shares whatever he possibly can here, and it's so valuable. And uh, the first thing of eight is work is valuable. Now look at this verse. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Now, this is not an endorsement of workaholism because he's talking about the quality of work that honors God and overwork doesn't honor God. Work that is, is uh, constrained, restrained, but has value based on truth. That's what he's saying to Timothy. Do things that you're not going to be ashamed of. And we all have work to do. There's a wonderful quote in the big book of AA, and it goes like this. We dare not let up on this spiritual program of action. We are headed for trouble if we do. There are actually denominations and faith people, people of faith, faith people, that believe you can achieve a level of sanctification where you no longer sin. Well, I think it's a sin to think that you no longer sin. That's a sin right there. That's arrogance. I just, unless I'm missing something here. How many of you are not sinning anymore? Okay, perfect. Well, you know, I, I just don't think that's right, that, that we can ever find perfection. We're always going to be uh, messing up and, and needing to repair it, and that's how God brings us closer together if we'll do it in the best way possible. But, you know, just acting like we don't sin, that's horrible, or, or just hanging in there, or just biding our time. And a lot of times, we have these fatal excuses. We say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm no good, or I don't have enough talent, or God couldn't use me. But, but, you know, under your own power, you can do that wheelbarrow thing, or you can ask for God's power, and you would be shocked at what you would be able to do, God's supernatural power. So he's saying to Timothy, look, work, be valuable, and uh, don't, don't kill the opportunity because you're not willing to do some work. Then he goes from this positive to the negative, and he says to Timothy, talk is cheap. Now, what he's talking about is arguing with 
fools. And he's, and he's saying to, to Tim, uh, don't argue with fools. It is an absolute waste of time. When I was very young, um, we had a, a standard poodle. And a standard poodle is about the size, the huge dog, this huge dog. And uh, my brothers, weird, uh, named this French poodle Sir Cedric Tino Bouvier, kind of an Italian-French combination. So he was truly a French poodle. And they, they uh, sheared this thing, uh, had these little puffy balls of fur, and so it was absolute canine abuse, There's no, the way they made that thing look. And, and it was so trimmed, I called, uh, I called him Hedge, because I wasn't going to do that big name, but I tried to teach our French poodle at age six to parlez-vous français. I wanted the, the, the doggé to barqué uh, and, and speak French, and I discovered it is a big waste of time to try to teach a dog to talk. They just, French, whatever, they can't do it. Now, some I understand can speak Spanish, but French, it's impossible. So, but there's another thing that I discovered later in life that is, well, dogs can't talk and a lot of people should not talk <laughs> because we say really stupid things and we're really foolish when we do. And it'd be best if we just didn't say anything. Uh, I've found this to be a major problem in my own life. But here's what he's talking about. Uh, by the way, let me just point this out to you. Paul uh, had attention deficit disorder also. We're going to look at a scripture over here uh, about uh, foolish talk. And then we're going to talk about some truth and stuff. And then we're going to come back over here. I've plotted the, uh, this out. Uh, this is, you know, when Paul's thorn in the flesh, I think was ADD of the mind. He goes this way and this way. And I read this perfectly. But we're going to come back to the other thing. But here's what he says first. Avoid worthless foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like cancer. As in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus, they have left the path of truth, claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. In this way, they've turned some people away from the faith. Uh, one of my favorite classes in seminary was a study of cults and how people start to think they've got this special thing over here that they know. And that's the way it was with this couple, that the resurrection had already occurred. You know, uh, I am looking forward uh, after I die to be resurrected from the dead. It's going to be an exciting time. But they were off and they were uh, teaching uh, things that were not true. Now, Paul gets off on uh, another tangent, and we'll come back uh, to that in a minute. Uh, but he does another passage after that, proving uh, that he just can't keep his mind focused. And, and it's an exciting thing. How many of you are married to somebody or uh, know somebody that has attention deficit disorder like Paul? And my, look at that. Wow. Well, bless you. And uh, I pray for you. And uh, my, you know, my wife's worst day is when I wake up and go, wow, what a beautiful day. I think I'm going to skip my meds and just cause trouble or whatever. <laughs> it's a nightmare for her. And uh, I, I feel for, you should pray for her. It's, it's, it's really sad. It, and, you know, there are three main problems with attention deficit disorder. So the other day, Solomon and I, we were in the car and we were, um, we were just talking. I was talking about, you know, dying, stuff like that. I said, you know, the worst way to die would be you're alone and you uh, take a big ice cube and you, and you start to choke on ice. Uh, and, and, you know, because if, if this doesn't go well, your last thoughts are going to be melt, melt, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and then if you die because you choke on ice, you can't breathe. Once people get there, the ice is melted. Now, you're hydrated, of course, but uh, they, don't, they have no idea how you die. And so natural causes. And so every time we see that someone's died of natural causes... Ice cube. That's what we, we know. That that's, that's what that is. Anyway, that has nothing to do uh, with anything. I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, even though I have attention deficit disorder, I'd love to talk to people. i give you a, a coronavirus uh, prevention fish bump at the end there. And, uh, but if you come up to me, you know, because of my problem, I, and we're talking, I'm not, I don't know what you're saying. I'm really not listening. Uh, I'm worried about what the other person behind you is going to say, or I'm listening to the other couple over here and what they're going through. And that's why when you finish up, you'll hear me say, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's really good. 
So just want to share that with you. It's uh, not something I'm uh, proud of, but it, uh, it is uh, true. So anyway, um, we come to this next passage, and uh, Paul is uh, also saying again, but it's not the next verse, it's on down. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. <laughs> that's, that's fun. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they will learn the truth. And then they'll come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they've been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So he's saying, you know, don't get in these arguments, and certainly don't uh, be angry at people and, and come down on them, you know, be kind and gentle, and maybe they will come to their senses, the Holy Spirit will convict them, and uh, they'll come back to the Lord, which is a, a wonderful way to be. And, and I say this, you know, uh, don't just not argue with other people, but spend your time, rather than talking foolishly and arguing, let, let's replace that with prayer. Let's do something positive with it. And if we could just pray, you know, sometimes I, uh, I kind of uh, talk to myself and I learned that if I'd quit talking to myself and just say it to God, then I could be in prayer all the time. And, uh, and this thing about praying without ceasing, you know, rather than complain about something, ask God to change it. And, and so don't argue, don't be foolish, pray. Corey Ten Boom, this great Nazi concentration camp survivor, she said, this, I think it's so good. She says, she asks a question. Now, is prayer your spare tire or is it your steering wheel? Isn't that a great question? We need to make prayer our steering wheel, spend time talking to God and not with foolish people and everybody is gonna get better. And then, you know, when he's saying to Timothy to be kind, he's saying something that's really good advice to all of us. Be the adult in the room. Don't, don't lower yourself to this kind of stuff. You be the one that's kind and, and understanding and gentle. The next thing that he says is, he's back up here, we're back up again. Truth's the foundation. We go back up to the 18th verse, and he talks about truth. So we've done, don't argue, don't argue, now we're gonna go to truth. Truth is the foundation. We're at 19th verse. But God's truth stands firm, like a foundation stone, with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his and all who belong to the Lord must turn from evil. So here's your, your foundation. It's truth. It stands firm. A lot of times our mood is our foundation or the way we feel is our foundation, not truth or whatever's popular. But we need to build our life on God's word and we need to build God's word into us. Now, a lot of people, they think all that means is when you get desperate, you, pe you play Bible roulette, and you roll the wheel, and, uh, or, or you could say they use thumb drive. They take their thumb, and wherever it stops, and then it says, get thee behind me, Satan, and that's not good. So you, you don't want to go by that. You want to have a plan where you can study God's Word, uh, get involved in one of the Bible studies here. It's so uh, fantastic. Uh, I used to go every uh, morning until I was having a little trouble sleeping, but uh, I would study the Bible, and I would come up here one uh, morning a week, study with some other men, and it's just so valuable to have a guided Bible study and not just luck or whatever it is with your thumb. Get involved and study that Bible. He says this, you know, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones, well, they're for everyday use. And he's setting up truth as the foundation, and here's our standard. He says that purity is our standard. So we want to have truth down here, purity up here. Because he says this, Tim, if you keep yourself pure, you'll be a special utensil. For honorable use, your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Now he's telling him the standard and then he's gonna tell him how you achieve that standard. But here he's saying that 
if we can have a pure heart and mind, God's got some really special things he wants to do with us. How many people, they don't keep a pure heart or mind. They, they compromise. They, oh, this isn't hurting anybody. Maybe they're not looking at pornography, but they're looking at some inappropriate images or things. And, and so then God would love to use them, but he wants them to purify themselves and be special like gold and silver utensils for their use. But in this next passage, he gives some, I mean, it's almost like if you want to know God's will, it's found in a verse that's very easy to remember its address. 2 Timothy 2, 22. That's it's at 2 Timothy 2, 22. And he says here in this verse, he's going to say, first of all, here is how we preserve our, our purity is, Run. Running is preservation. That's the first part of that verse. And it says this. Run from anything that's, that stimulates youthful lust. And then you can run after righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Now, that's not just saying run from pornography or inappropriate images, but run from that person that kind of is working down the hall, that man or woman, you kind of feel energized, you're stirring something up. There's a connection there and it's not good. You need to run from that. And if you're on crutches, that, that you're not uh, exempt here. You, you, I think the Greek reneho uh, probably means get out of there. How many times has someone thought, oh, this, this isn't hurting anyone. I'll just do this. I'll just meet with that person. I'll just go to that and then they're involved in an affair, emotional or physical, whatever. There's betrayal involved. And here is, if you want to know what to do, run. Run from anything that stirs up useful lust. And, and he's saying, you know, rather than pile on here into this junk, when we run, uh, things are going to get better. We're going to have good stuff when we're pursuing the good stuff in our life. And then he says this, number six, is groups are redemptive. Here's the verse. Here's what it says. Then this is the same verse, 2 Timothy 2.22, last part. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Now, if you're not in a group and you're just attending church, you're really missing some great things. This is a church with a group. Uh, if you need a group, we got a group. This is a groupy church. And, uh, you know, there are... Uh, grief groups, help you get rid of those ungrieved losses, Recover, life recovery groups. You know, uh, my wife is so uh, wise. She's been working with recovery and folks for years, and she does a group on Friday for women recovering from anything at noon. And then at four on Sunday, she, she works with a, a group of women that struggle with sexual integrity problems, and they come and they, they feel safe, and it's amazing uh, sometimes they'll come over to the house and watch movies, and, and these women are really putting their lives back together. We've got, uh, I don't know how many men in different groups around our different campuses uh, that are involved in every man's battle groups, and uh, the, Michael Carey and, and his wife Kristen do those. I think probably any given week, we've got 400 people in some kind of group that's helping you get better in addition to Bible study groups and our home groups, life groups, there's a group. And here is where he's telling Timothy, enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure heart. So let's get involved. If you're not involved in a group, they're so redemptive. And uh, it's just such an, a wonderful, amazing thing when people get in groups. Then he goes back to something very negative, and he says this. We shift over into the third chapter, and he talks about a religion. He doesn't use this term, but selfism, where people in the last days are going to worship themselves. And when, he, when I read the scripture, you just <laughs> ask yourself if this isn't a description of our day and age. Here it is. Here's the verse. You should know this, Timothy. That in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will, only, will love only themselves and their money. 
and they'll be boastful and proud and scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. I'll just stop right here and say, you know, if you're really into yourself, you need to really respect your parents because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them because nobody's going to want to live with you and you'll be back home in the bedroom with a little penance up there and, uh, and then you'll go to a job and it just, won't, it just won't cater to you and so you won't have a job. You'll be back home with your parents. So respect them because you guys have got a future together because mom and dad are going to say, well, we could never, ever uh, just put him out on the street. He's 37 and we, we can't uh, do that. You know, and I don't think you should ever put a child out on the street. Put him out in the front yard. Put uh, the driveway is a good, the front porch, something like that. And, and it's a fatal, it's a fatal lie uh, that keeps people kind of dependent on each other. And rather than a job, see, he's working on how can I get a bigger allowance from mom and dad now that I'm in my 30s, I need more money. But we, we also know that no child that's ever been uh, put out of a house has ever gone out on the street. They go live with somebody else, see? And then that group gets really tired of them, and then they come back home and say, okay, what, what do I need to do here? So it's important, people, respect those parents. You're gonna be spending a lot of time with them. They'll, they'll consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others and have no self-control. And they'll be cruel and hate what is good. And they'll betray their friends and be reckless and puffed up with pride. And they're gonna love pleasure rather than God. That, that is such a description of a self-obsessed society. And, and I gotta tell you, uh, it, it's just a description where kind of everybody's a narcissist. And we know that narcissism, spelled backwards, it spells obnoxious. And there are so many uh, horrible things about this way to live. And um, I was just looking at uh, the, the March-April edition of Psychology Today, and there's an article in there, and a lot of people think everything in there is anti what we think and believe here. But listen to this. Uh, Mark Leary wrote this article, Putting Yourself in Perspective. And he says this, living in the modern world has left us without limits on self-centeredness. From anxiety to xenophobia, the personal and social distress that everyone feels could benefit from a little less me. I mean, it is a disease, this me-ism. It is a religion of self-ism. And we have to get beyond that. And, and here, Paul, of all the things he could be saying, Paul wanted Timothy to be aware of what's going to happen because it's not going to be pretty. And Paul knew the scriptures well. And in Ezekiel, it talks about the watchman on the wall. And the watchman's job was to inform the people if, if they were going to be under attack before the knife comes that he needs to warn the folks. And if you don't warn them, then the blood that is shed is on your hands. So, so Paul knew this was going to happen, and he wanted to be sure that Timothy was aware there's this time of tainted love is going to come where everybody's interested in only themselves, uncaring and unloving. And it's a horrible, horrible thing. Now, here's the sad thing. A lot of times when people get into this state, they're blind or deaf to anyone that wants to tell them the truth about themselves. And so they don't change. And they're unaware. There was a great Scottish minister. Listen to this quote. Alexander McLaren said this. The worse a man is, the less he knows it. The worse a man is, the less he knows it. Sometimes we need to just tell somebody, you know what, I, I know this is going to be painful for me. Uh, I need you to tell me the truth about myself. And let them be open without penalty, without defense, about things that you literally could work on. And um, it's important that we're always open to what God wants us to hear 
And there's some people that maybe they don't even, you don't even like them and they don't like you, but they might have some truth that you need to hear. And so I'm just hoping and praying that in this self-obsession, if there's a problem, that you, you could get some help. Because our kids are watching. And a lot of times, whatever we do to our kids, um, well, it's because it was done to us. Now, we love our kids until 9 p.m. We, we, are, uh, we love to connect, but after that, it's, it's iffy every night. So uh, we try to get them into bed, and, and they know that that's really important. But, but I got to tell you, um, we, we were at an intersection the other day, and my wife, she is the best mother I've ever known. She sees these little feet oh, kicking, and, and all of a sudden, we see this, this mother hit this child and we all have tough times and struggles and and then she's back on her phone and then she throws something back at this child and the dad's yelling and man we just felt so sad for them and this little baby and we just prayed for that family because if they'd get some help I know that they were probably so mistreated and they don't know any better and, and so we just, we're repeating the mistakes um, of our parents, what they did to us many times. But if we'll get some help, we can turn all of that around. There was one final point that Paul wanted to make for Timothy, and it was this. Religion is powerless. Look at this. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. There are all these people that are religious and they're religiously doing this and they're carrying this, this burden. Because you know why? A lot of times they're afraid. Many times when we're angry up here, it's because there's a deep fear. What are you afraid of? That's a question I, I always ask myself. What, what is the fear that's holding me back? What is down there that's in me up here, it's anger. I was in this, doing this group with a, another therapist, and, and this man, he and his wife were saying, he's so angry and bitter toward our children. And finally, I just said, what are you so afraid of? And he just burst into tears. And in this moment of insight, he said, I'm afraid I'm not going to have the power and the strength my dad had. And so I lash out in anger because it, it makes me feel powerful. But once he started to deal with the fears, he didn't have a reason or a need to be angry. A lot of times we stay stuck with our wheelbarrow because we're afraid. And so I, I just am encouraging you to ask, what am I afraid of? What do I need to do to work through that fear? Now, if you're like me, you don't really enjoy watching someone else's home movie but I want you to watch my home movie. I want you to watch this 10-year-old child. This is Amelia. She has just climbed up this structure at Hoosier Heights. She has no safety rope. Down below is a big, big, deep 10-foot thing that if she falls in, it's like a, what stunt people fall into. So if she falls, she'll be fine. But I've made it uh, over to about here, and then I get afraid and go back down. But look at her. She's I asked her, are you afraid? She said, yeah, I was afraid. Most 10 year olds, oh, there we go, okay, uh, hang on. <laughs> this kid is strong. And so, <laughs> she's very high, reaches up, misses, and then she gets it, and oh my goodness, and and at Hoosier Heights, when they saw that she was coming up over that, the crowd went wild. She makes it over this thing. And, and she was afraid, but she did it. And I'm just saying, if a 10-year-old could do that, you could hold your breath for two seconds and be baptized underwater. You could do that. You could, you could raise your hand if you... Or ask if you wanted to receive Jesus, even though it would be scary. One of my good friends that came here 18 years ago, he was an atheist. His parents were devout atheists. He walks in here an atheist. 
He says, Steve Poe was preaching on predestination. I have no idea what, what that was all about. But when he said, does anyone want to receive Christ? He said, my atheist hand, didn't he, couldn't even believe it. My atheist hand was up. And he said, I prayed a prayer and I accepted Jesus that day. And he has been serving Christ ever since. That could be you. You don't need to know what I, I, I know I'm confusing. I have attention deficit disorder. But the power of the Holy Spirit could be moving in a supernatural way. And all this religious stuff that is so powerless, I mean, it really could unlock everything for you. Religion, it has no power. But there is a supernatural power. And last week, the monochromatic Steve Carter, who is such a great teacher, he, he mentioned this song, Jesus Take the Wheel. I'm saying maybe Jesus take the wheelbarrow. Jesus take the wheelbarrow because Jesus might have something much better than a wheelbarrow. Look at this. Maybe this is what Jesus has for you. You come to Jesus. He may have a truck and he may put stuff in there that you could never haul on your own that could become the foundation, the building blocks. It could help other people. But if you stick with this thing, You'll never, I'm not saying come to Jesus and he'll give you a truck. A lot of ministries do that, or a Cadillac. They'll say that. I'm not saying that. But I am telling you that I believe there is a supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, and it enables us to do things we could never, ever do on our own. And so I'm hoping this morning, when, when Andy comes up, our campus pastor, that something might happen here. You might Accept Jesus, even if you're an atheist, you might just, or you might say, okay, I believe in Christ, but I've never fully lived for him, and I'm going to rededicate my life, or I've been dedicated, but I've never asked the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to come into my life and fill me up. When you accept Christ, you are full of the Holy Spirit, but we need to ask him, come on, let's do something fantastic. We believe we're made for more. We ask God to empower us to do more. And I'm going to ask every person here to do one thing for me and for God and for the kingdom. And that is that when you get home or on the way home, would you be willing to just have a little discussion with whomever it is, family, person you're dating, whatever, about being made for more? Are, is this family made for more? Could we do more for God? Was I made for more is the question. Because I sure do believe there are a lot of people that think this is the Christian life and it's not the Christian life. It's not the abundant life. God wants so much more. You have been made for so much more. So Andy, come on up and, and let's uh, close out this service and God bless you and I hope and pray through all the clutter that you heard something that might make your life a little better today. God bless you. Uh, thanks, Steve.